And now the introduction of the book, Minhajul Abideen ila Jannatu Rabbul Alameen, the best way for the worshippers, leading them to the paradise of the Lord of the Universes, by the author of the book, Imam Ghazali. All praise is for exalted God, who is most merciful, who created with His absolute power the earth and the heavens, and set right the affairs of the universe with His exclusive wisdom. From amongst His creation, He created jinn and men for His worship and obedience, and He has said in the Holy Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Chapter Al-Dhariyat, verse 56 I have created jinn and mankind only that they may worship me. Chapter 51, verse 56 Now the path lies very straight and illuminated before him who wants to follow the path of his worship and obedience. All kinds of proofs and guidance are clearly available to those who possess a discerning vision. However, it is only exalted God who has the exclusive power to guide on the straight path of guidance or to push into the darkness of the error and is straying whomsoever he wills. He knows very well who are following the straight path of guidance and who are in error. Countless durood and salam or mercy and salutations on the merciful messenger of God, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the leader of all the prophets and messengers, may God have mercy upon them and on his household and progeny till the day of judgment. May glorious God guide by His grace all the Muslims on to the deeds which attract His approval and pleasure. Devotion and obedience to exalted God are the fruit and object of the acquisition of all knowledge and learning. The greatest gain of life and the main goal of human existence lie in the expression of servitude and submission to Him. This attribute of servitude to exalted God consists in the provisions of life journey for the awliya or the friends of God, the intimates of God, the path of the powerful, the course of the dignitaries, the objectives of the magnanimous, the symbol of the pious, the profession of the righteous, the favorite of the wise, the path of luck for the lucky, and the road to paradise for those desiring paradise. Glorious God has said, وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ I am your Lord, so worship me alone. When I looked closely into this path and pondered over it thoroughly, I found that it is a very difficult and hazardous path to follow. It is a path full of very wide and arduous valleys and is blocked with hurdles and calamities. Highway robbers and hidden enemies, which is the self and the Satan, are lying in ambush. There are only a few friends and helpers. As this is the path leading to paradise, the Garden of Eden, it should indeed be difficult and hazardous. It is just according to the description given by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. إن الجنة حفظ بالمكارة وإن النار حفظ بالشهوات. Paradise has been covered with unpleasant and undesirable things, and hell has been covered with desires and lusts. In other words, he who desires paradise has to pass through many repulsive and unpleasant situations in this life, and he who wishes hell is absorbed in satisfying his lusts and desires. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has further said, Allah wa inna al-jannata huznun bi rabwatin wa inna nara sahlun bi sahwatin. Beware, paradise is situated on a, on a high steep ground and hell is situated on a smooth low ground. This means to say that it is difficult to climb up to paradise and easy to get down to hell. 
In other words, the way of paradise is very difficult and the way of hell is very easy. Apart from this, it is another problem that by his nature man is very weak and the world is brought with all kinds of difficulties. Religious matters require full-time attention and man has inadequate spare time at his disposal for all this on account of his occupation with the worldly affairs. Life is short and the calamities of the times are very severe and death is nearby. A man traversing on this path must know that provision for the journey is indispensable, which is nothing but worship and obedience. If anyone has not provided himself with the provision in this world, he cannot get it after death. One who has furnished himself with it will reach the goal of success and will be prosperous in both the worlds. He who remains deprived of this provision is grievous in loss and is doomed to perish. So this is a very difficult and hazardous path indeed. Those desiring to take this path are very few. Fewer still among these are they who put into practice their intention with firm resolution. Those who are able to reach their goal are much fewer. However, those who reach the desired goal are honorable servants whom exalted God has chosen for his acquaintance and relationship. It is He who helped and protected them and admitted them into paradise by His mercy and grace. May exalted God include us all by His mercy among such successful, fortunate persons. Amen. When I found the road to paradise so difficult and full of hazards, I took care to make provisions and was able to find out some how the necessary supplies and needs I am full of hope that with those, these provisions and supplies, the journey to paradise will, God willing, be completed with success and peace. These provisions and supplies consist of ability to worship, to put this ability into practice, to acquire necessary knowledge. All this can be performed only with the help of exalted God. I have therefore compiled many books on the subject of undertaking successfully the journey to paradise, for example, Ihya Ulumuddin or the revival of knowledge of path to God, Kitabul Qurbati Ilallah or the book of closeness to God, etc. All these books contain fine academic issues and philosophical points which the general public could not grasp. Therefore, they began to taunt and offer uh, adverse comments on these books. There is, however, nothing surprising about this attitude of theirs. There is, however, nothing surprising about their attitude, this attitude of theirs. There can be no composition better than the Holy Quran, which is a composition of the Lord of the Worlds, but the imprudent people did not spare even this divine book from their taunt and adverse comments and said, إِنَّ هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ Surah Al-An'am, verse 25 This is nothing other than the fables of the men of the old. Chapter 6, verse 25 Thus, when they treated the divine book in this way, how could they spare from their taunts a book of a human composition? It is, however, appropriate for educated and wise men not to dispute with God's creatures, but to treat them kindly. I therefore pray to God, the King of all kings, to help me in compiling a book to which all may agree and which may be beneficial to the people. The sustainer of the world who responds to the prayers of the helpless accepted my prayer by teaching me the secret points and signs of Deen or the path to God and a totally unique setup. 
for the compilation of this book, which I am going, with the help of God exalted, to state now. It is that which, when a man resolves for the first time to take the path of worship, he receives from God guidance and help. The Holy Quran refers to this help and guidance. أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنْ رَبِّي Surah Az-Zumar, verse 2 He whose heart God has expanded for Islam is in a light from his Lord. Chapter 39, verse 2 there is also hadith or tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which means the same thing, that when divine light enters man's heart, it creates in it a spaciousness, capacity and openness. The noble companions asked, O Messenger of God, is there any sign of this light by which it may be recognized? He, the Prophet, peace be upon him, replied, There are feelings of distance from the house of fraud, that is, this worldly life, turning to the eternal house, that is, the hereafter, and care to prepare for death before its arrival. If anyone has these qualities and tendencies in him, it is a sign that light has entered his heart. When the intention of taking the path of worship arises in a man's heart, he begins to think that he has been enriched with the blessings of exalted God, such as life, strength, wisdom, power of speech, and many other blessings and means of comfort bestowed upon him by God. With these he protects himself from troubles, losses, distresses, and calamities. So he begins to believe that there must be some being who has granted him and all these blessings and bounties and that if he is now grateful and obedient to that being, he will afflict punishment on him and take away his blessings. He also begins to think that the true benefactor, that is God, has sent prophets, may God be have mercy upon them, to furnish to the people knowledge about him. These prophets displayed, with the help of God, supernatural miracles lying, uh, lying beyond human power and capacity. These prophets, may God have mercy upon them, taught the people that theirs is only one sustainer Lord who has power over everything. He is all-knowing, everlasting and eternal. He has asked you to do good deeds and refrain from sins and vices. He is able to punish those who are disobedient and to reward those who are obedient. He knows the secrets of the hearts and the notions passing through them. He has promised to grant salvation and rewards. He has also warned the people against his punishment and torment. He has commanded them to be regular in abiding by the injunctions of the Sharia or the Divine Law. All these directives and teachings create a firm belief in the hearts of the servants of God that all these assertions are quite possible from the rational point of view and nothing is impossible. This belief creates in the hearts of the people a fear of exalted God and on anxiety about accountability before Him. This fear and anxiety awaken them from carelessness and negligence, complete the final argument and dispel their pleas and excuses and urge them to reflect upon the signs of God. As a result, a sound-minded person searches for ways and means for his salvation and a place of security. All this shows him the way of acquiring knowledge about the creator of the universe by reflecting with his sense and wisdom upon the universe and what it contains. 
He is guided to know the Maker of the universe by pondering over His creation, so that He may come to belief in the unseen, and may know that He has only one Master and Creator, who has imposed on Him the duty of obeying the injunctions of the Divine Law, to enforce what is right and refrain from what is wrong. Thus the first valley in the path of worship to God is to reflect on the creation of the universe to acquire a knowledge of its creator. This is called Uqbatul Ilm Wal Ma'rifa or the valley of knowledge and getting to know the creator. It is necessary that the servant of God should reflect intently on the signs and proofs needed to cross this difficult valley and inquire about the learned scholars who are able to guide the people on the path of the hereafter. They alone are qualified to lead the Ummah to the straight path. He should benefit by their guidance and seek their prayers. Then. He will, God willing, succeed in crossing this valley and will have full confidence in the unseen and shall admit, I have only one true and genuine God who has created me, bestowed upon me his bounties, asked me to be grateful to him for his blessings and to obey him openly and secretly and to refrain from ingratitude and disobedience. He has promised everlasting reward for obedience and gratitude and everlasting punishment for disobedience and ingratitude. The knowledge of all this will urge him to worship his Creator and Master, whom he has come to know and recognize after great exertion and searching. He has, however, not come to know as yet what is the way of worshipping God and what are his duties about obeying his Creator openly and secretly. What open and secret obligations and injunctions of the divine law he has to obey and discharge. After acquiring this knowledge, he crosses the first valley, which is called Uqbatul Ilm Wal Marifa, or the Valley of Knowledge and Getting to Know the Creator, God. After having learned these injunctions and obligations, he turns to obedience and service. In the meantime, he remembers the countless sins and excesses he has committed in his life and is urged first to repent for all his sins and purify before establishing relationship with God. At this stage, he faces another valley, Uqbatu Tawbah, or the Valley of Repentance. He will therefore engage himself in worship and devotion after crossing this valley of repentance. At the same time, he will confront another valley, Uqbatul Awa'iq, or the valley of obstacles. This is the negative valley of forces that will deter him from obedience and devotion. Now he finds that he cannot do full justice to worship and devotions owing to obstacles which are four in number. First, the worldly life. Second, the, creation, the creatures. Third, the self. And fourth, the Satan. The servant of God faces these obstacles in his path. He gives up or becomes indifferent to worship, sometimes on account of the worldly charms, the creatures, the, sh the self or the seduction of Satan. It is therefore necessary to get rid of these obstacles by renouncing the world, going into seclusion from the creatures and resisting the self and Satan with force and firm resolutions. Man's self or lower self is the strongest of all these obstacles. It is easy to get rid of those obstacles, but this lower self is most tenacious as it is the weapon of human life and, is, and it always accompanies man till death. It is also very difficult, rather impossible to eradicate it. 
It can, however, be kept under control with the bridle of with the bridle of taqwa or righteousness or God fearingness, so that it may be subdued to obedience and prevented from rebellion. Thus it is also a permanent valley and God's assistance is needed to cross it. After having crossed this valley with God's help, man will face certain obstacles which will not let him devote himself to worship with full attention and submission. These are four in number. Number one, sustenance. Man's self tries to keep him away from worship by frightening him from poverty. By being engaged in devotion and disassociating himself from the world, worldly concerns, he cannot earn his livelihood enough to support his dependence. Number two, fears and misgivings. Man remains in doubts and suspicions about the suitability or unsuitability of a project and job he wants to undertake. He fears failures. Number three, calamities and hardships. Man thinks that by taking the path of God, he shall have to face calamities and hardships along with opposition and displeasure from the people. He shall have to bear various troubles and difficulties. Number four, divine decree. This divine decree or fate sometimes favors and sometimes goes against man and is often full of bitterness. Sometimes man is confronted with these obstacles called Uqbatul Awarid, the valley of hindrances. In order to cross them successfully, he stands in need of four items. Number one, to have full trust and exalted God in the matter of sustenance. Number two, to entrust everything to exalted God in the matter of fears and misgivings. Number three, to bear with patience the calamities and hardships that fall on Him. Number four, to submit passively to the will of exalted God in the matter of divine decree. When a man has inculcated all these attributes in him and has with the help of Almighty God crossed this valley, he will face another valley. He shall feel that his self is not inclined to indulge in worship and has fallen a victim to extraordinary negligence in this matter. It has become adverse to righteousness and is interested in sins and vices. Now in such a situation, an impetus is needed to create an interest in the self, to turn to worship and obedience, and to keep away from sins and vices, and create in it a fear of exalted God. The impetus lies in two acts, first, hope, and second, fear of exalted God. In other words, man should hope for reward and recompense which God has promised as a reward for piety, righteousness and good deeds. This act of helping will urge the self to worship, obedience and good deeds. Similarly, a man should think of the grievous punishment and of the tortures and hardships which he is likely to face in the hereafter. When this fear is born in the heart, man will give up disobedience and sins. This valley is called Uqbatul Bawa'it, the valley of urge and impetus. When this valley stands in the way, man should cross it, keeping in view the foregoing directions. After having crossed all these valleys, there will be nothing to stop him from devoting himself to worship and good deeds with full concentration of mind and due submission. At this stage, he shall feel the presence of such attribute as shall induce him to indulge in worship and obedience with full concentration. After engaging himself in worship, man shall feel that two major calamities are still spoiling his worship. 
One of those calamities is show or ostentation, and the other is pride. The love to show his worship defeats the very purpose of his worship and destroys it altogether. Sometimes pride is born in his heart because of his righteous deeds, and he begins to feel that he has become a very devout and saintly person, and then he falls a victim to self deception, then the entire acts of righteousness go to waste. In this way, now another valley stands in his way, which is called Uqbatul Qawadih, the valley of factors ruining worship. To cross this valley safely, he stands in need of two other attributes. Number one, sincerity, and two, God's grace and mercy. With the help of these attributes, he should adorn his worship with sincerity and faithfulness to exalted God and should believe that all these attributes and good qualities are due only to God's help and mercy. A poetic verse says, This good luck in him is not due to his own power and efforts, but it is due to the help and favor of merciful God. In the absence of such feeling, there is every likelihood that good deeds are being ruined and these words may, God forbid, become applicable to him. He lost the world as well as the hereafter. He should cross this valley with God's help. After having crossed all these valleys, man attains the goal of worship and freedom from all calamities. Now he realizes that he is permanently drowned in the bounties and mercy of God. It is due only to God's infinite mercy that he is enjoying the virtue of worship, good deeds, and total freedom from sins and vices. It will mean a grievous loss if he becomes neglectful of this bounteous master of his master, bounteous master God. In that case, he shall lose his status as a wali or friend and as a favored servant of God. He may be deprived of his blessings and his good deeds. He therefore praises exalted God and pays thanks to him. We call this Uqbatul Hamd wa Shukr, or the valley of praise and thanksgiving to God. When a man crosses this valley, also with the help of God, he realizes that, that he is about to reach his destination and attain his objectives. After advancing further on this path, he shall arrive in the land of God's mercy and grace and the, and the plane of divine love and access to God. He shall be admitted into the place of the pleasure of God and the abode of the angels. He will be granted a special status of nearness and intimacy to God and admission to the grand assembly of those who always invoke and pray to exalted God. He will become entitled to the gifts and bounties of his Creator. He will become so deeply absorbed in the company of the spiritual angels that he shall pass the remaining part of his life in the garden of God's remembrance. Bodily, he will be in this world, but spiritually and virtually his heart will remain attached to the affairs of the hereafter. His love for and interest in the affairs of the world will vanish gradually. Every moment he will be waiting for the call of death with a desire to meet God. The call will ultimately come to him, accompanied with glad tidings. He will be transferred from this transitory world to the eternal world of the hereafter, where he will be ushered into paradise with great honor, ease, comfort, and luxuries and love. Divine reception and entertainment will be too rich and sumptuous to be described in words. 
this unique status and these blessings and bounties will be on on the increase day by day even the angels will envy him on his success and promotion we pray to exalted god to include us all by his mercy among such servants and favor us with his great gifts and bounties and and exclude us from his rejected and condemned servants may he help us all to put our knowledge into practice to pass our lives according to his will and pleasure and let not our knowledge be a curse on us this is all very easy for him as he is the most merciful of all who show mercy wama dhalika ala allah bi aziz and this is not at all difficult for god in order to summarize what we have said so far the following is the order and setup to which i have referred in the beginning the gist of this order and setup it is that seven valley stand seven valleys stand in the path of worship and devotion to god number 1 the valley of knowledge and acquaintance or gnosis of god number 2 the valley of repentance number 3 the valley of obstacles number 4 the valley of hindrances number 5 the valley of urge and impetus Number 6 the valley of factors ruining worship and number 7 the valley of praise and gratitude to god a discussion of all these valleys will complete my book minhajul abidin ila jannatu rabbul alamin or the best way for the worshipers leading them to the paradise of the lord of the universes I shall state briefly the relevant meanings and important points and shall also give some details thereon in separate chapters for this I seek God's help and la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there is no power and might other than God alone